Hi, and welcome to another edition of A Few Minutes With, the podcast that showcases Illinois' College of Applied Health Sciences. I'm Vince Lara, and today I'm speaking with Mike Raycraft and John Welty Peachy, professors in the Department of Recreation, Sport, and Tourism, to talk about the impact of a world without sport during the coronavirus outbreak. All right, uh, John Welty Peachy and Mike Raycraft are with me from Recreation, Sport, and Tourism, uh, and we're talking about the, the state of affairs uh, due to the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, and how it's impacting our world in terms of this is the first time we've all three of us have been through work stoppages in all the sports, but this is the first time on a global scale where we've had no sports activity. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, John, I'll start with you on this because you've worked on sport development and how it impacts countries. For you, what's the, what, can you tell us what kind of impact uh, a world without sport has uh, on, on, let's even start with the really low ground level community and then a city state and even a country. Sure. And, um, you know, it, it, be, besides the economic impact, which is, is certainly huge, um, one of the things that's happened is I like to think of it as we've, um, in communities, uh, we, we have what's called a third space. Uh, we have home, we have work. And those are places that we spend a lot of time. But we also need what are called third spaces or third places. And these are uh, venues, places we go where we experience community, where we are social with others, where we um, bond, where we um, uh, relax social norms in some ways, um, make connections. And we're in an age right now where we don't have these third places and sport provides those third places in many respects when you think of the venues the arenas the stadiums going to the local pub to watch the game uh, gathering at somebody's house to watch the game so right now we've we're socially distancing um, and we're taking away these third spaces these places which i think is going to have some profound impact in terms of how people at the local level can experience community um, maybe some creative ways will emerge uh, to do that. Uh, I think there's going to be impact uh, broader at the at the national, at the international levels. When you think about how sport has played a role in building community and bringing together disparate others from various backgrounds, um, and we don't have that right now. Um, hopefully we will get in the future, but we've removed that context at the present moment. So I think the impact is going to be profound when you think about uh, the social adjustments that we're going to need to make um, in the very near future. My hope is that we come up with some creative ways um, to perhaps, that we haven't thought about yet, <laughs> to perhaps um, uh, provide that connection, whether it's through sport or other types of leisure services that can still help people experience those those third places, which are so vital for us. You know, John, let me ask you another question. Um, do you think that if the sports leagues had decided to play without fans, uh, there'd still be that element of uh, people would still be able to plug in uh, even without being able to attend? Well, I think so, but I'm not sure that that would have been the right thing to do. Okay. And when you think about where we are right now um, and the fact that we have um, athletes and coaches testing positive for the virus, um, you know, when we think of the broader picture, um, what I think we need to do to, to really help society, you know, deal with this pandemic. Um, should we continue to provide that content and, and provide and, and expose our athletes and coaches and referees and trainers and such to, you know, potential um, long-term effects of the virus? I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's, it would be worth it. Even though we were missing this social element, I think, um, you know, we have to think about the greater good in some ways and the health of the, um, you know, the athletes, the coaches and the staff that would still have to be involved and be in, uh, and be in the stadiums and the arenas. Where, I wonder where, and either of you can answer this, if, what do you think of the IOC deciding not yet to pull the plug on the Olympics? I can, question, <laughs> I can leave them in there again, and, and Mike can certainly uh, fill in too. But sure. um, personally, I, I, I question that a little bit. Mm -hmm. and I know why they're hesitating. 
um, simply because of the magnitude of the of the scale of that decision. Um, but one of the things that it does, though, is when you think about where where are the athletes training now, and how are they training, mm. and are we saying that we don't care about their health right now? So essentially, if an athlete's been training all these years and the Olympic Games are still on, they still have to somehow keep that level of um, fitness and um, on point, you know, readiness with their sport. And how, how are they going to do that and not be at risk? Um, so where do they train? How do they train? Um, I think there's a lot of questions there. So we're saying, yeah, we're going to still do the event, but you need to go on training as you normally would, you know, to, to be able to qualify and such. So I, I'm not sure I agree with that personally. Um, when you look at the greater good and, and, and as well, all the other um, events that have canceled, not just in sport, but across the board and, and uh, concerts and, and music festivals and um, all, all of the really social places and events, uh, big events that are uh, postponing. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure about that decision. I'd be interested in Mike's thoughts on that as well. Well, I was chatting the other day with a a colleague of mine that was an Olympic athlete in 1980 on the U.S. Olympic team. And where the, you know, so the president for the plug being pulled uh, is there. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about it here. We are 40 years later. And, you know, looking back, I think, you know, it was kind of agreed that was the right decision that sometimes things are are just bigger than, um, than a sport event. This is one of those. What you know? Let me ask you. What What do you guys think? Is there a different impact depending on state uh, size of country when uh, these events are canceled? In other words, uh, the Olympics canceled in the United States. You know, it's it's certainly a big event here, but it's not as big as it is in you know another country. So, does the the cancellation depend on scale of country or or importance? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the United States has got, you know, with with you know, high end college and professional sports where that's they can focus on that, where you get to, you get to some smaller countries around the world. The Olympics is a is a is the whole is the whole party. It's their opportunity to, to, you know, to compete on the national stage. So, yeah, I think it's a bigger deal other places. It's a big deal here, too. But it's, a, you know, we have alternatives that other countries don't. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Mike. Um, you know, I, I think it it is scalable. I think the um, impact certainly for certain countries, as Mike said, you know, you're, you're gearing for an event where you do have perhaps a little bit of prominence. Um, you you excel in a certain sport or activity, and and uh, it it provides that um, national identity. It provides that. Um, you know, rallying point for um, citizens in a country and such. So to remove that, um, I think I think the effect would be more pronounced for for certain countries, um, whether it's based on size or based on um, how sport has been developed in that country. Um, you know, we have some countries that might be large in size, but still, sport is not uh, you know as developed as it here as it is here in the United States. So. Um, yeah, the impact's gonna gonna really vary by a, a lot of different factors. I think for 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 nations here, but but really, I think you know we have to do what's right, and you know think about we're all in this together in many ways, and we we don't want to think that I think one event um, such as the Olympic Games is more important than the health of the world, and um, I think that's a very um, myopic view, you know, to have that. So um, perhaps we'll still be able to host it in some uh, modified fashion, you know, based on how things go over the next month or two. But um, I think we have to think about the greater good. And I, and I hope our sport executives and those making decisions will um, will do that. We'll keep the greater, the greater good of society in mind. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's come up uh, in my in my classes last week was a conversation about the Olympics and how, you know, the future could be where it goes to having just from one host city to make it a worldwide event. 
where you would host you know wrestling one place track and field one place basketball one place and kind of divide it up instead of having it in one host area hmm. which was interesting because it seemed to it would provide more people the opportunity to go to live events it would maybe help out in terms of security and whatnot and it kind of makes me think sometime um is this the type of thing which could maybe trigger that type of a thought where it's a worldwide games where it's spread out hmm. or one city isn't taking it the you know all the expense and all you know all the heat you could spread it out spread, spread it out across the globe uh, you know economically obviously is the biggest hit that a world without sport uh delivers but does it deliver a bigger hit to us psychologically or physiologically yeah, that's a great question, and um, I'm not. Sh- I, I think both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure we can get into degrees. I think psych- psychologically, it's, um, uh, it's it, it is it is very very important. And um, when you think of the identity that many of us have with regards to sport, um, not just athletes but fans and um, highly identified individuals. Um, and those that work in the industry, um, when when we're when we have something removed from us that we're so invested in, you know, whatever that might be, um, that that can lead to 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 a lot of um, psychological challenges, you know, for people, you know, from depression to um, uh, lethargy to to all kinds of things, um, and. I, th- I think we're going to have to, to find ways to help people in this time think about where do we get our identity from. Mm-hmm. So you, you think of athletes that are so identified with their sport, and, and that's all we have ever known and done. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of an hour, your season's over, or these decisions are made that take away what you do. Um, if you're so invested and identified in that sport that you have basically nothing else, I think that's where the psychological impact's going to be, um, in my view, really pronounced. That I think we're going to have a role for sports psychologists and other healthcare professionals and mental health professionals in the coming days to to reach out and to help um, those that are really affected by this. And I'm I'm talking athletes here right now. Mm-hmm. To, to, to provide some services to, to really help them get through this. I think that's going, to be, that's going to be vital and important. One of the things that I've seen that I think is interesting is with youth especially, um, I'm, you'll say under 20, uh, eSports and online gaming and whatnot um, has helped them a lot hmm. in terms of connecting and the kids are, are able to play and be together um, that way and connect um where i don't think the younger generation is going to be as impacted perhaps as um 20s 25 on up mm-hmm. frankly they're finding an outlet and then that makes you wonder hey okay, where does that go and how does that impact kind of the role of e-gaming and esports um in the next five five years john in terms of of youth sport networks since you you deal a lot with this and the, and the, and the construction of them how long does a does a youth sport network have to wait to restart uh, based on what the major league sports do in other words if if baseball restarts in june do little leagues let's say they don't start till july to make sure yeah that's that's a really good question um, i think um, i i I'd, I'd like to see that Um, There would be some pause, there would be some gap or some um, time that we do wait, Um, particularly when we think about children and youth and and being in these spaces right now, that um, I don't think it's imperative that it's all aligned, um, that Little League must start, you know, say if um, MLB goes back um, or when the season might start. Um, that that's all aligned so much. Again, I think it's um, we have to think bigger than than that, and, and think of re- really about the the welfare and uh, safety and the health of the kids and the youth. You know, if there's a little bit of a delay, um, as we see, you know, as the CDC is saying, there could be multiple waves of this virus that it kind of 
peaks and then goes down and comes up and goes down. We, we want to be certain that we're not exposing children and youth too early again. Um, so I don't want to think we have to rush to to go back to to um, starting these legs up again. I think let's let's be sure and let's follow what's recommended by the CDC and other health bodies. Not being so concerned that we have to align, say, with when the major leagues start, but really reflecting on what's best for you know, the population that we're that we're serving. What what kind of a, a role can a youth sports coach take in this time? Is it merely outreach? You know, do they send out you know emails to parents, or or or, or do they just back off? No, I think they do need to be not aggressive, but they do need to stay involved because there's so much connection that kids and parents have invested in their youth sport um, time and leagues. And I'd be interested in Mike's take on this as well. I think, you know, we don't want to send too much information, but we certainly want to be in touch to express that, um, you know, we're, we're still, we still have this community. Um, maybe there's some creative blogs and some ways that some online, you know, connections can happen that leagues can implement so that uh, folks can, you know, stay in touch or maybe there's some virtual gaming <laughs> that can happen, um, you know, between and with teams or ways that that sense of community that uh, this can continue to, to go on. You know, during this time, you know, if kids are stuck at home, uh, and so maybe leagues can see their role as trying to help create some spaces for for their youth, for their children to continue to interact. Although it might have to be looked differently right now, but I think those would be some ways that you know they can continue that that connection point for them. Mm-hmm. One thing you've seen this week uh, online are a lot of entertainment people uh, doing. Uh, musical concerts out of their living room. I watched one an hour ago with Brian Wilson. Hmm. Um, and frankly, it, it could be, in a, uh, from a marketing sense, it, it could be an opportunity for professional sports athletes uh, to market themselves to youth in terms of, hey, we're home, you're home here, let's connect. And I want, we're to, today we're going to do a session on understanding the fundamentals of of baseball or whatnot you know one of the audiences where i think pro sports have had a tough time in recent generations is connecting with young people it's so expensive and and whatnot um this could be that opportunity to to you know to connect and find new ways for kids to build bonds with uh, with their teams i you know one thing that this period guys of no sports has made me think about is what would have been the impact of not having sports on our world I mean, our vocabulary would be different. Uh, I was joking with Mike before we started recording about how many cliches we use in everyday life. You know, uh, turnaround victory for a politician, a comeback, you know, uh, clutch comeback by Biden. You know, like, there's so many things that sort of uh, seep into everyday life. And, and for you, uh, for both of you, how do you think life would be different if we didn't have this you know this infrastructure of sport you know to go back to what to what john said earlier about the third space i i don't think that's gonna i mean I, I, that's a there's always going to be a need for that you know a connection hmm. and so i don't think that's that's not i cannot imagine a world like that because i don't think we're really built like that as as, as human beings you know we need there's always that 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 connection point you know and you know, we're, we're, we teach an RST of, you know, the, the whole leisure connection in terms of what is it that brings us all together. And what mm-hmm. brings us all together is this, is this drive to, to the third space and what is this that motivates us? So sports will always exist. Is it, is it, gonna, is it going to change and evolve? Yeah, it, sur- it sure is. And just like, you know, just like we evolved after 9-11 in terms of how we look at spaces and security and travel and and whatnot you know we're going to look at the world differently after this too um and that's not all bad for sure i I agree with mike and i don't know if we could ever have a world without sport and play and if you if you look at the history of sport or, or play 
which sport really is. And you'll see that in every culture and every country, there is sport and there is play. There's not one culture that does not have it in one form or the other. No, it manifests differently, of course, with um, different types of play and sport. But even in caveman times, <laughs> you know, there was there was play. You know, there was this this element. I mean, so, you might see more of a growth and more 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 of a prominence of individual sports over team sports. Hmm. Yeah, that could even, be, you know, yeah. it, that could be. Yeah, um, I was out running this morning, and, and I think I saw more people outside than I ever remember on my running route. <laughs> and and because it's this one space we can go right now, but you know, it's it's an interesting question, Vince. I um, you know I, our, our answers aren't aren't great, but it's because I think we're having a hard time conceptualizing. Yeah, agreed. World without sport and play, and how that could. Um, could come about, but um, you know certainly if we didn't have that, um, there'd be a huge void. But um, you know there has to be some some third place. I mean there has to be these these activities that provide meaning socially and such beyond um, the home and beyond the work. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have that. I don't think we really have society in many ways. So um, so we we we. We, we have to creatively now continue to think about how do we provide these spaces, whether it's an RST in sport or um, entertainment, um, you know, a variety of ways we continue to um, offer um, you know, these, these spaces for people because it's, it's fundamental to, to society. That's a, a good point to jump to something that Mike and I talked about before we started recording, Mike, which was you thought that this there was a possibility of bringing about some kind of positive societal change, and I'm wondering if you'd uh, expound on that. Well, I think there's possible societal change in that we're having the opportunity to spend time at home with our families mm. and to rediscover some things that are fundamental to the to the human experience that maybe we've ignored. Um, to bond and to make those connections, and you know, some, you know, and so we to read. Mm -hmm. to clean out your garage maybe <laughs> to do to do things that are you know that, that are positive you know and and frankly to, to reassess and you know i stopped playing the piano 20 years ago because i got busy well i can perhaps rediscover talents and interests that you know i haven't you know i, ha I haven't really touched on in, in 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 20 years and so i don't think that's all bad yeah and i think we all walk out of this experience changed and you know certain certainly it's again it's not all bad John, I'm imagining you have a similar feeling. Sure, I do. I, I agree totally with Mike. And you know, just reflecting on you know the past couple of days for our family, and um, exactly being able to um, reestablish or, or um, connect uh, a little bit away from the frenzied life that we probably all feel like we're normally in. <laughs> um, and so I think there, there are some ways that maybe this, when things get back to normal. Um, whatever that normal might be that we have emerged changed or maybe we value things a little differently we value family more which would be a positive change we value relationships um, you know the old saying you don't you know you don't know that you really value something until you don't have it mm -hmm. you know until you miss it and um, you know and maybe you know we're, we're going to reevaluate hopefully the importance of people in our lives, um, not take people for granted. I think there can be a lot of positive that, that comes out of this. Um, so I think that's, you know, a hopeful thing. You know, it, it'd be very curious to see what happens on campus in the fall, mm -hmm. um, because I don't think a lot of the undergraduates really understood what was going on. They have a tendency to live in their own world, and all of a sudden this whole thing kind of get the rug got ripped up under, underneath them and you know mom comes with station wagon to pick up the bedding in the dorm and we're going home and they have five months to kind of assess you know what life is away from campus and 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 what what value those campus life and campus connections and those relationships and the and the scholarly part etc all have um so i think they'll come back in the fall tremendously engaged and tremendously excited to be back and part of the campus and, and anxious to connect with people. Um, 
probably be tired of talking on the phone and <laughs> FaceTiming, and maybe we can, you know we can get away from screens and, and, and connect face to face. You know, I'm, I'm in closing. I just want to ask you both about you. You both will have students who have internships this summer in you know in industries that are are really affected. Well, everything is affected, but but are uh, affected by this uh, by this coronavirus crisis. And what kind of advice do you have for them? Um, Mike, you and I talked about it, so why don't you answer that first? Well, I would say first and foremost, um, the University of Illinois and the Department of Export Tourism is gonna do everything they possibly can to ensure that the students have a good experience, a meaningful experience, and will graduate um, on time according to their pace um we're you know in terms of working with the organizations we have we have students that go out in all types of industries um sport being a, obviously a, a big part of them um we're waiting right now i think in terms of what does that look like what does the experience look like uh it's a little bit early to tell for some i know we've got some kids that are out this that are out uh, now in the doing us doing spring internships and a lot of them are doing exactly what we are they, you know they're continuing to work and and um uh contribute uh, from their apartments their homes etc uh different way and so they're certainly going to be learning it's a very very interesting time to be out on your internships for sure because you entered one world and you walked out of another one yeah and i think you know there's certainly going to be an impact too on um, if we if we think about say sport or RST, which is you know certainly recreation, tourism, and sport have all been affected by this. But in terms of uh, employment and how and wh when and how organizations are going to be hiring and what that means for our graduates and how will job roles change? Um, uh, will will there be more virtual? options now for um, our graduates to come in and on uh, frontline positions um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves a bit um, and what the supply demand is um, you know as we move forward a little bit um, uh, so i think um, you know i'm hopeful but that i, I think we're, we're i come back to to we have to think outside the box and really be creative in terms of um, uh, how we provide internships, uh, what the nature of our job roles are, and how those may need to be redefined um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so that can be positive too, you know, in terms of uh, changing how we do business. And it might be a time when businesses do reflect on um, how we engage with fans, how we put on our product, how we stage our events. Um, so it, we, we could emerge from this stronger, you know, to put the, the positive spin on it. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. It's certainly a great time to be creative. Right. Um, my advice to the, my students is to is to keep up, to read the, to, to follow the news, uh, to follow what's going on in sport and related industries and, and, and reflect on it a bit and, you know, reassess and come, you know, determine what role can they have. It's kind of a new, uh, new insight new new perspectives because the whole industry is going to change and frankly they could be in front of it my thanks to mike raycraft and john welty Peachy. for more podcasts on illinois college of applied health sciences search a few minutes with on itunes spotify iHeartRadio, radio.com and other places you get your podcast fix thanks for listening and see you next time